your south, you play yeah. all the way until you get to Italian. The, <laughs> the Vikings. <laughs> yeah, right. That's about the middle. It's, it's like the driver. So my mom's side is, is from Austria. I was muted. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Good morning. Welcome to Bible class today, and uh, great to be with you uh, in person and online, and glad I have a working microphone today. I knew exactly what it was. Um, we had chapel here this morning done by our eighth graders, and uh, they did just a great chapel, and they used all the mics and all the sound equipment and had uh, changed all the settings, but uh, no, they did a really nice chapel, and uh, having an eighth grader uh, really connecting with a lot of those parents on just kind of how emotional it is when you see your kids doing chapel for the last time. And uh, for some of them that have gone all the way through all those grades, and uh, this year especially, just been a wonderful, uh, faith-enriching, uh, great, great class, and uh, to see them doing chapel the last time. They were originally scheduled to do chapel back in November, and uh, that's when we had some COVID issues and they had to cancel that and reschedule. And when they found out that it was rescheduled for May the 4th, they about lost it. <laughs> Do you know why? The connection between May the 4th and Star Wars. May the 4th be with you. And if you're a Lutheran, you'll reply, and also with you. So they did weave some good uh, Star Wars elements uh, into their chapel, which the kids were really excited about. And always great to see when kids can watch uh, movies or listen to music and find the gospel connection. Where, where in the movie, where, which scene, what dialogue can they make a faith connection? And the kids did that really well. And so uh, happy May the 4th uh, to everybody uh, today. We're going through our Heroes of the Old Testament Bible study. We're continuing on our journey. And uh, having done Elijah last week, 
Uh, it makes sense that we're doing his successor, Elisha, today. And we'll be uh, still in 1 Kings, still in the same time period, and we'll dig in and get settled into all of that. Uh, as we're going through these heroes of the Old Testament, we're looking at how God worked in people's lives uh, throughout history, particularly in, in the people of Israel, uh, his chosen people to bring the Messiah. And all these things that God did through the centuries through, through the people of Israel were pictures and images and prophecies getting ready to show the Savior of the whole world. Uh, and so even though these are, are amazing stories and we see what God did, these are shadows of the things that were to come and the reality is found in Christ. And so anytime we're looking through the Old Testament as Christians, we always want to say, so what does this have to do with Jesus? And, and have that Christocentric reading of, of Scripture. Uh, so let's uh, say a word of prayer, and then we'll dive into God's Word today. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this, uh, this day, another day that you have made that we get to rejoice and be glad in. We thank you for uh, this time of year, Lord, this spring, uh, the flowers, uh, the, the grass growing. Uh, we know the rains are essential to all that, Lord, uh, but we look forward to sunshine and enjoying your creation, too. Uh, Lord, it's such a hopeful time as we long for those warmer days and uh, greener pastures. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have in you, that in Christ we always have uh, hope, uh, looking forward to the best that is yet to come. So may we be your Easter people, your, with Easter hope and Easter joy uh, throughout these days. Bless us as we go into your word today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, same time period as last week, same part of, of Israel, uh, taking a look at the prophet Elisha. Elisha is one of the last great prophets in terms of doing a lot of miracles and, and having God's power on display through his life in really, really big ways. And both Elijah and Elisha foreshadow the coming Messiah. And the things that these prophets did are the things that the Messiah is going to do, just even on a, on a bigger scale. Elisha's kind of interesting because, you know, these guys lived so long ago, it, it's really hard to grasp, you know, their setting, their context. Archaeology, well, I you, can, you know that I love that. It's very exciting. It's still so limited. It still tells us so little. Uh, but Elisha's one of the few Old Testament characters that we have a little bit of understanding of what he looked like. This is how Elisha is portrayed uh, throughout Christian art, and it's somewhat accurate to the text. How is he portrayed? He's bald. How do we know that? Open up to 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. This is one of those funny, quirky stories of the Bible that you don't really learn in Sunday school. But when you come across them, you're just like, whoa, I don't know that I've ever read that one before. Or you just skipped over it. At the end of 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 to 24. Do you see where that's at? Uh, my heading says Elisha is jeered. 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning at verse 23. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some youths came out of the town and jeered at him. A group of hoodlums, the local gang, this group of kids, troublemakers, come out and they start teasing him. Go on up, you bald head, they said. Go on up, you bald head. And they're mocking him, they're making fun of him, teasing him. Well, you don't do that to a prophet of the Lord. But these are kids. They don't know any better, right? This is a big mistake. Verse 24. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. And he went on to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria, went on his way. Don't mess with the prophet of the Lord. Or, or, or yeah, making fun of uh, bald-headed men, apparently. Uh, oh, it's kind of a, a humorous, uh, but uh, you know, interesting, quirky story from Elisha's life, and actually a good example of the kind of accounts that are connected with Elisha. Uh, it's these short snippets, uh, mostly action, 
you don't really have a lot of words from Elisha. We don't have long books. It's not like Isaiah or Jeremiah or even the minor prophets. We have very, very few words of Elisha, but we have a lot of stories of these events and episodes uh, that display the power of God in his life. So uh, anyways, I always thought that was kind of interesting when these bears come out of the woods and teach these kids a lesson to respect your elders and uh, don't make fun of, of Elisha the prophet. What else do we know about Elisha the prophet? So the time period is, you, you may recall when we were looking at the prophets, uh, like the writings, we looked at some of the minor prophets and we said, you know, there's some prophets that live before the exile, pre-exilic, there's some prophets that live during the exile, like uh, Ezekiel and Daniel and others. Those are exilic. Then there's some prophets that came after uh, the, the exile, post-exilic, like a Haggai and Malachi and, and so forth. Uh, Elijah and Elisha, do you remember where they fall in that sequence? Pre-exilic. So this is before the exile to Babylon. This is before the destruction of Jerusalem. This is, uh, you know, in those earlier days of the, of the divided monarchy, uh, you know, after, not long after the time of David and Solomon. Remember, David and Solomon get split, the kingdom gets split to a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. Do you remember where Elijah was? Which kingdom he was uh, ministering and serving in? It was the northern kingdom. And so that's where Elisha comes as well. So Elijah and Elisha were prophets of the northern kingdom of Israel after the time of David and Solomon, during the time of the kings, but before the, uh, they, they succumbed to the Assyrians for the northern kingdom and the destruction of Jerusalem in uh, uh, 587 BC for, for Jerusalem and, and so forth, to the Babylonians. So uh, they're living in that northern kingdom time. Elijah... The focus of his ministry was really the wicked king Ahab and uh, his uh, also equally wicked wife, whose name was Jezebel. Yep, Jezebel was about as pagan as a, a, a queen could be. And, uh, and, and both of them uh, just really uh, adopted a lot of these pagan practices, turned their backs on the Lord, uh, really persecuted the prophets of God, including Elijah himself. And uh, so that's the main focus of Elijah. Elisha comes just after that. Ahab and Jezebel die, and he gets to be there for five more kings. Uh, he's, he's there to serve for about 50 years. And over that stretch of 50 years, there's a number of kings that come after Ahab uh, like King Jehu and a new dynasty, and Elisha is the prophet, the prophet of the Lord, like the main prophet during that time. Now, just like for Elijah, there was always a, a school of the prophets. There was like a group of uh, prophets in training or disciples. You could think of them as disciples of Elijah. And there were a number of prophets of the Lord that lived in the land, and uh, they just saw Elijah as the leader. When Elisha becomes the new head prophet, there's also a school of the prophets. There are young apprentice prophets, there's prophets in training, there's uh, prophets of the Lord who follow now Elisha. Their names are very similar in Sunday school. That's really hard to teach kids the difference between Elijah and Elisha. Their name, the meaning of their name is related, but it's also different. Elijah means the Lord is God. Yahweh is God right? Or God is Yahweh. It's really, uh, so Yahweh is God. Elisha means God is salvation or God is Savior. Uh, so uh, that's, the, uh, that's the different name, but it's still pointing to God. God, uh, as, uh, uh, God is the Lord for Elijah and God is salvation for Elisha. We know a little bit about his upbringing. We know the name of his parents. We know where he was from in the northern kingdom. We also know that he was out plowing the fields when Elijah called him. And as he was working there plowing the fields, in a similar scene to Jesus calling the disciples when they were fishing, and how immediately they dropped their nets and followed Jesus on the shore of Galilee, and you can recall that story. It's very reminiscent of that, where Elisha is plowing in the fields, and Elijah comes up and he says, you're going to follow me, and right there, Elijah stops, or Elisha stops what he's doing 
And, uh, and he, he goes and he says goodbye to his family. I'm going with uh, Elijah the prophet. And the oxen that he was using to plow the field, he actually slaughters the oxen as like a sacrifice to God, kind of like a, and, and has a celebration, almost like a going away party. And they have a feast, they have a festival. He sacrifices to the Lord. They have a big gathering as now it's this, it turns into this send off where they ask for uh, the Lord's blessings to be on Elisha as he now goes and follows Elijah. Uh, did you guys cover Elijah going up to heaven in the whirlwind when you looked at Elijah? So that's, that's still fresh in your minds. And as he's telling Elisha that he's going to be the successor, Elisha has a, a really bold request. He asks for a double measure of Elijah's spirit. A double measure of Elijah's spirit. To be able to be like kind of twice as great as Elijah. That's a pretty big ask to ask from one of the most powerful and uh, you know, amazing prophets uh, that had ever lived. But that's exactly what he receives. And he does. He does the same things that Elijah does and more. And so he receives Elijah's uh, double portion of his spirit. He also got something else from Elijah. Do you remember what uh, Elijah gave Elisha as he kind of passed the torch? His cloak, yeah, his cloak, his uh, robe. Uh, sometimes it's called a, a mantle. And, uh, and, and we uh, actually have that portrayed in our windows somewhere. I'll have a picture of that coming up in a little bit. Uh, so we have Elisha serving over 50 years under five successors to King Ahab of Israel. He's in the northern kingdom. We have some of Elisha's prophetic words. He would speak prophetic words that then would come to pass. They came true, right? Would Israel defeat this army? Well, Elisha could tell you. What was the king of Syria going to do next? Well, Elisha could tell you. In fact, one time the king of Syria is so outraged because Israel seems to know their whole military plan. It's like they have a spy and they say, well, it's Elisha the prophet is there and he tells Israel every move you're going to make before you move it, before you do it. And uh, so he sends soldiers to go uh, get Elisha, but of course the soldiers uh, are, are unsuccessful. So there are some prophetic words, but what we have more than anything else from Elisha are the miraculous deeds. And just like with Jesus and others, the deeds are there to confirm his identity. He's not just a magician, he's not a sorcerer, he's not a, even like a miracle worker, he's a prophet of the Lord. And so the miracles that are associated with them show God's character, they show God's heart, and they also confirm that Elisha is the prophet of the Lord. You should listen to what he has to say. And so uh, more than anything, we have all these actions of Elisha. Normally we save the New Testament connection for the end, but I actually wanted to bring this in right now because I thought this was really cool. Uh, John the baptizer came in the spirit of Elijah. You, you'll recall that at the end of the book of Malachi, the prophecy was there that I'm going to send my messenger ahead of the Messiah. Uh, Elijah is going to prepare the way for the Lord. And lo and behold, John the baptizer comes. He's there in the spirit of Elijah. He's there to prepare the way for the Lord, the coming Messiah, and, uh, and for the one who comes next. He's preparing kind of for his own Elisha of sorts. But for a while, John is questioning that, and he actually gets thrown in prison. And so this is uh, the account from Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. When John, John the baptizer, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. When Jesus summarizes his ministry with those words, he is drawing on a lot of Old Testament prophecies and foreshadowing. And he practically gives a little list of the things that Elisha did, the prophet. Elisha uh, brought sight to the blind. Uh, people who were dead were raised. They, the, they got up and walked. Uh, people with leprosy, remember Naaman, the Syrian, uh, was cleansed of his leprosy. 
uh, the, uh, the good news was proclaimed to the poor, to the destitute. He's always proclaiming good news. So I thought this was kind of a neat way to see already in Jesus' words there these echoes of the miracles that the prophets did that were all pointing to Jesus. So let's take a look at a couple of these things that not just that Jesus did, but that Elisha did that pointed to the Messiah. Uh, this one is from 2 Kings chapter 6. Let's flip over to 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning at verse 15. And I tried to zero in on some of the key uh, parts of this passage. Uh, this is after, uh, this was after the king of Syria was so mad because the Israelites always knew where he was going to go. And so he says, you know, are there spies? What's going on? And they said, well, it's Elisha, the prophet. He's telling them every, all of your moves. And so he's sending a band of soldiers to go and destroy Elisha, the prophet. They're after him. And this is where we pick up in verse 15. They're surrounding the city where the prophet is. Verse 15. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. I think he was actually asking Elisha, not God. But that was what he was, it was his exclamation. Verse 16. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Does that sound familiar? Go ahead and underline that in your Bible. If you don't have that mark, that is a really cool verse. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. They're looking at an army with horses, chariots, hundreds and hundreds of soldiers, and they're just a little village, a little town, a city there, and they're outnumbered. Verse 17, And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What did he see? Armies of God, right? The, the Lord of hosts, right? The God of angel armies is always by our side, right? You know the song? This servant, it was like all of a sudden he was able to see what's going on behind the scenes like to pull back the curtain and look at the spiritual battle that's taking place and to see all these angelic hosts, these angel armies surrounding them that way outnumbered the army of the Syrians. How cool to see that from like heaven's perspective, right? To say, okay, what you can only see with your eyes are these, these Syrians, but let me show you what God's doing that you can't see. And we know from Ephesians, right, that our battle is not, our struggles, not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, the, the kingdoms, right, the forces of darkness in the spiritual realms. We don't see it. But in this moment, this servant got to see the spiritual battle, and he got to see the armies, uh, the angelic armies that are all around them. Verse 18, as the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people with blindness. He can also do the opposite. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, This is not the road, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria, the capital. Verse 20. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. They're in the enemy capital. <laughs> he just took a whole group of Syrians, marched them right into the capital city, right into the main square, and all of a sudden now they can see and look around. Where are they? They're in, they're in the heart of the enemy. Verse 21. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Verse 22. Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. 
So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they'd finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and returned to their master. So the bands from Aram, from Syria, stopped raiding Israel's territory. Now, so many times in the Old Testament, it gets bloody and gory really fast, right? This is actually one of those cases where it kind of turns out how you'd hope it would, in a sense. I mean, it really is amazing that here they march the enemy right down into the main square, and you think of other stories where the enemy is captured, and rather than bringing vengeance, rather than bringing retribution, right, uh, they actually bring compassion, care, they feed them, they clothe them, they throw a feast for them, and they send them back home. And that changes the relationship now between Israel and Syria, and they stop raiding each other at, and from that point on. Really kind of an interesting thing. But notice Elisha uh, is, is there doing miracles of bringing sight to the blind and also blindness as well, but he can reverse that. Uh, so the, the blind are, are seeing. Leprosy, this is a very famous one. Uh, turn back a chapter or two to chapter 5. The healing of Naaman. Naaman is the commander of the Syrian army. And uh, Syria is also called Aram, but uh, I think Syria gives us a better picture of where it is. We know their capital in Damascus and so forth. Uh, so Naaman's the commander of this kingdom of, uh, of, of armies of Syria. And in some of those raiding, uh, raidings that they did against Israel that was just referenced, they would actually capture people and take them back as slaves. And uh, so they'd actually captured some Israelites and taken them back to Syria. One of them, a little girl, ends up a servant for Naaman in his household. Uh, I, think he, I think she serves Naaman's wife. And as Naaman and his wife are talking about this new uh, diagnosis that he just received, right? Some of the worst news he could get, leprosy. Uh, they're talking about what are they going to do and what does this mean? What does this mean for his career, his position? And this little girl o overhears that. And again, rather than harboring this bitterness in her heart and saying, good riddance, these people are terrible. I hope she gets leprosy, right? Instead of thinking that, what does this, this Israelite girl do? She says, I know where you can get help. If only my master would go to the prophet who's in Samaria. He could heal him. And so uh, Naaman gets a letter from the king of Israel, and, uh, and he's ready to go. And uh, let's, let's jump in here a little bit. Verse 4. Let's start at verse 4. We'll just read through this. This is 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 4. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. Remember, Israel and Syria are always fighting. Verse 8. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be clean. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not the Abana and Parfar the rivers of Damascus better than any of these waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he went, he turned and went off in a rage. Uh, Naaman's skin is infected, but more importantly, his heart, right, is infected and filthy. Rage, anger, all those things. Pride. Verse 13. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, 
If the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he consented. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. So Naaman goes down, so he finally has this humbling of his heart. He goes down to the Jordan River. He dips himself in the water. His skin is miraculously, right, fountain of youth, like that of a young boy, it says. And, and, but more importantly, his heart is cleansed now. Now he says, now I believe. Now I know that there is a God in Israel, right? That this, this is done by the Lord. He's a changed person. What event in Jesus' life might this hint at or ring bells about? What event in Jesus' life are there connections to here? Dipping in the Jordan River? Baptism? Yeah, baptism. The baptism of Jesus at the Jordan. John the baptizer, of course, is first doing that. And all these people are coming out to the Jordan River to be washed. But it's not a washing of dirt from the body. It's this pledge of a clean conscience towards God. It's this uh, connection with God. It's for the forgiveness of their sins, right? That baptism would wash them clean. And so there's this great connection between the washing of Naaman in the Jordan River and baptism and what Jesus brings for us in baptism, which again, it's not about the outward thing, it's about a change of heart and about that clean, creating in us a clean heart. Now, Naaman had all this money and all this wealth, right? And he offers it to Elisha. He's going to give it to him. And what, and what does Elisha say? Do you know the story? He says, no way. I'm not accepting any of it. This is God's work in your life. This is a free gift of God's grace. You can't buy forgiveness or, or God's mercy. Take your stuff and go. So he, he takes his things and, and he goes. Uh, you know, it's always interesting like at church because we know that we need like the offerings and the support of God's people to do the work of the ministry, right? To, to run a congregation like we have, a school that we have, the lights, the utility bill, the mortgage payment, uh, staff salaries, all those things it takes quite a bit. But we're always trying to be very careful that we don't ever equate our offerings as like payment for God's grace. Lutherans especially are very sensitive to that. You know why? Indulgences, right? When Luther start, you know, back going to Martin Luther days, when they were selling the forgiveness of sins, it was exactly what Naaman wanted. Oh, if I need grace and forgiveness, let me give you all this money, and then I get my sins forgiven before God. And Luther, you know, read through the scriptures and said, that's not it at all. Salvation is a free gift of God by faith alone and put a stop to the whole indulgence system. That was the 95 Theses and the Reformation. So Lutherans are very sensitive to making sure that we're never equating that together. Um, I remember one time early in ministry, I, I did a shut-in visit. It was a new member. She just moved down from northern Michigan. And, uh, and so I was visiting her in her home for the first time. She was homebound. And, uh, and after we did a devotion and we did communion, uh, she got out her checkbook. And she said, how much do I owe you? And I about fell out of my chair. And I was just like, and I tried not to show like kind of how offended I was at that or like not offended, but like, well, nothing, nothing. Please don't, don't give me nothing. This is, this is God's grace. It's a free gift. And she was just so like, she's like, oh, well, my old place, it was a different kind of church. And she's like, oh, we always paid them for a communion or whatever. And I just said, no, we don't do that in the Lutheran church. This is just God's gift. If you have an offering, you can mail it into the church office. And uh, I, I think she still ended up forcing a, a pie or a piece of cake or something on me <laughs> that I ended up taking. But, uh, but I really wanted to be clear that this is God's grace. We're not going to, you know, this isn't, uh, this is God's grace is a free gift. When people are baptized at our Savior, particularly adult baptism, when we have adult baptisms at church, uh, we invite people to, we still ask people to choose a sponsor because even adults can have a, an encourager, 
right? A sponsor for baptism, someone who's going to encourage them in their faith. We also invite them to make a baptismal offering as like a thank offering. But we have one condition. It can't be to our Savior. It's got to be to a ministry or a charity of their choice. So maybe they choose something else or, you know, Friendship House or a ministry or another place that they've connected. But there is some, you do give thanks because of God's grace. You can respond to God's grace with generosity. That's very natural. But why do we say that it can't be to our Savior? Because we don't want to give the impression that you're like paying for the baptism, right? It is God's free gift of grace. So there's some of those instances where, on one hand, we want to cultivate generosity and, and support for the ministry, while we're just being clear that salvation is a free gift from God. But you guys have been in the Lutheran Church long enough to know that. We like to keep that nice and neat uh, apart. So Elisha does too. And he sends Naaman on his way and takes nothing from him. Do you guys know the rest of the story, the follow-up? Throughout these stories, Elisha has a servant, an attendant, named Gehazi. And Gehazi is normally a good and faithful servant of Elisha. And he does a lot of things for Elisha. But this one, he just couldn't take. Gehazi saw the gold, the silver, the clothing, all of it. And he was astounded that his master had turned it all away. So after Naaman goes on, starts leaving and heading home, Gehazi slips out without Elisha knowing. He runs down the road. He catches Naaman, says, stop the cart, hold on. My master, and he lies, he says, my master changed his mind. He'd like a few sets of clothing and uh, some of the silver. And he takes it. <laughs> and so he takes it and he goes back. Now, if you've worked for a prophet who knows what the king of Syria says behind closed doors, you know, why would you think that you could get away with something like that? Uh, so as soon as he returns, Elisha says to him, Gehazi, what have you done? Why on earth did you do this? And Gehazi looks down, and now the leprosy that Naaman had just been washed clean of, Gehazi has that leprosy on him, and he ends up being leprous. So that's kind of the, the now you know the rest of the story. So. Uh, okay, so, but Naaman gets to be cleansed through that, uh, the people are healed of leprosy. Again, pointing to what Jesus would do. One more great uh, encounter is uh, in instances where these prophets brought the dead to life. And this, too, is going to point to the ministry of Jesus in some pretty big ways. We're kind of going backwards through this. So 2 Kings chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4, there is a, uh, a woman who is married, who has a son, and she is just a great supporter of Elisha's ministry. You know, there, every, every pastor knows of just wonderful, like, people of peace that are just really hus hospitable, encouraging, and just there to support in whatever ways they can. She is such a, a dear woman as she supports Elisha in his ministry. Whenever he's passing through town, she makes sure that he has a little room, a little place to stay. Uh, she gives him food, water, a, a comfortable place, some hospitality, and then he continues on his journey. Well, there's several instances in Elisha's life where he gets to minister to this family, to this woman and her family, in some really big ways. Um, so this is obviously, this is a huge one here, and we're going to pick it up at verse 27. Uh, this is where the son, this is after the boy went out to the fields with his father, complained about his head hurting, and, and fainted. And as they carried him back to the village, by the time he got back to, into the house, he had died. And so they laid him on the bed, and, and she said, the woman said, go get the prophet, go get Elisha. And so they're running out to get him, and, and Elisha's on his way. Verse 27. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away. That's a servant. But the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress. But the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. The prophets don't know everything, only what God reveals. 28. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord, she said? Didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes? 
Elisha said to Gehazi, Tuck your cloak into your belt, take my staff in your hand, and run. If you meet anyone, don't greet him. And if anyone greets you, don't answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. She got up, so he got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, The boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door, and the two of them prayed to the Lord. That's a key point right there, right? Again, this is God's action, God's request. The two of them prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay upon the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands, and stretched himself out on him. The boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. It's kind of funny that they made that note. Verse 36, Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite, that's the woman, and he did. When she came, he said, Take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. Uh, Very similar to, again, the ministry of Jesus with a little girl and uh, with a little boy of name, the woman, the widow's son and and name. And uh, so many, I mean, we wish God would answer this prayer so many every time. Uh, But there's very certain times where he does in this way. And uh, and again, it's for his purpose of confirming Elisha and working through him. So again, this would foreshadow what Jesus was going to do in his miracles, and Jesus' miracles are the foreshadowing of what he's going to do for all of us, right? Jesus is going to raise everyone, right? All of those who are in him. Every child that's been lost, every mother or father we've said goodbye to, uh, you know, everybody that uh, we've had to depart with in the faith, he is going to raise them. He is going to restore them to full health. That's the day of resurrection. And all these miracles that Jesus does and consequently uh, Elijah and Elisha, are foreshadowing what God's going to do in in the day of the Lord uh, in that heavenly victory, right, that we can't wait for. So uh, the dead are raised. Really big, uh, important miracles here. One last one that I wanted to throw in. I know I said that was the last one. 2 Kings chapter 4, we're really close, verses 42 to 44. Do you see where that is? It just follows shortly. Yeah. You about there? Verse 42, a man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread, baked from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men, his servant asked. Sound familiar? You can see what event in Jesus' life this is going to point to. But Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. I wouldn't be surprised if it was 12 basketfuls. (laughs) Uh, So, again, as you read through the account of Elijah and then through Elisha, uh, you see a lot of connections to the ministry of Jesus, how these were foreshadowing Right? Images, pictures, pointing to the Messiah who was going to come in the spirit of Elijah, Elijah and Elisha with a double portion of each, the ultimate prophet. Uh, these are just some other instances where Elisha got to bring good news to people who were destitute, who had lost things, who were, who were mourning or, or unsettled. Uh, they find out that the water was bad and they weren't able to drink it. Elisha made it clean. The water is provided for Israel's army. They they didn't have anything to drink. Elisha said, go dig trenches in the entire field, and by morning it'll be filled with water for you and all the animals. And it came to be. Uh, The one widow doesn't have any money to pay off her debt. All she's got is a little jar of oil. Elisha says, get as many pots and jugs as you can collect and just start filling them with oil out of that one little jar. And she filled all of them, and she paid off all her debt. Tainted food, these bad gourds, these wild melons. Uh, Everybody was going to get sick because that was all in the pot, and and he makes the food safe. Uh, One of the prophet, junior prophets, is out, 
and he's, and he's chopping wood, and the axe head flies off the handle, and it goes into the stream. And, and he's really despondent about that. He's really concerned because it was borrowed, and, and he can't do anything. And uh, Elisha, do you remember what he does? Makes the axe head float to the top, and he, and he returns it, and he restores that. Lepers get to proclaim the good news to, uh, to Samaria as the Syrian army flees. That's an awesome story, 2 Kings 7. And the Shunammites' land or income is restored. That's the same woman whose little boy was uh, brought back. So Elisha gets to be a bringer of good news. Again, we don't have a lot of words from these prophets, but we have a lot of actions. And through all of them, God brings this wonderful message because as, as it was made clear, it's really the Lord that does all these things through the prophet, but in the lives of his people so that he can be glorified. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as these point to Jesus, Jesus pointed to Isaiah 61 that kind of captured this. And I think this captures the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of Elisha. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So as you read through the story of Elisha and the ministry of Jesus, you can kind of read that in the, in the background of Isaiah 61 and how God's Spirit uh, allows us to be good news people, right? And that's what we get to be because of what God has done for us in Christ. Uh, and then there's the window that we have. It's a kind of an odd window. Again, some of these are really hard to make out. Uh, do you see it over in the bottom right corner? And what it is, is it's actually the robe or the cloak falling from the sky. Maybe uh, the little yellow ball or something might be the, in the faint distance, the little chariot of fire going up into heaven. But here floats down, it's floating down from the sky, a robe, a cloak. And that's Elijah's mantle cast on Elisha. We do have a hymn in our hymnal that mentions that moment. Uh, LSB 682, it's a song we sing at ordinations or installation of pastors. When there's a successor pastor, when God provides a new man for the ministry, right? A new prophet, a new pastor is put into office. The song is called uh, God of the Prophets, uh, Bless the Prophet's Sons, Elijah's Mantle on Elisha Cast. And we make reference of that, how God provides a successor. God provides another one. And, uh, and we praise God for that. And so I thought I'd make mention that that's listed in our, in our hymnody. So that's uh, the story of Elisha as we uh, kind of conclude that section of these pre-exilic northern kingdom prophets. Amazing stories, great part, great heroes of the faith, great part of the Bible. And uh, pray God's blessings on your Bible reading, Bible learning. And uh, again, uh, with questions about God's word, anytime to email Pastor Chris, email myself. I know you guys have great conversations among yourselves as well. Uh, we've got a wonderfully uh, learned group here and uh, just enjoy talking about God's word with all of you. Uh, so let me do a closing prayer and we'll be on our day. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your power at work on display in the life of Elisha, your servant, and how, Lord, you are at work in all of our lives uh, to bring your good news, to bring your hope, to bring your restoration uh, into our hearts and our lives, and then to share that with those around us, Lord. We thank you that we get to be your good news people. Uh, Lord, we know ultimately all those hopes and dreams, uh, the greatest miracles of all, are going to be when our Savior returns. The new heavens, the new earth, uh, resurrection life, uh, skin and flesh renewed, and strengthened, Lord, uh, to worship you in your everlasting kingdom. Until then, help us walk by faith, knowing that behind the scenes, your angel armies are surrounding us, protecting us, and uh, leading us and guiding us in all that we do. Bless the rest of this day and this week, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. God's blessings. Have a great rest of the week.